So hello everybody and welcome to the seminar hosted by the yeah. International Inequalities Institute of the LSE. My name is Kirsten Sendrup. I'm currently the acting director of the Institute. And today I'm incredibly uh, pleased to be able to welcome you all, but also our main speaker, Marina Mendes Navarez from the International Monetary Fund, who is going to present a paper on artificial intelligence and the expected impact on employment and work. Marina is an economist at the research department of the International Monetary Fund. And her general research include macroeconomics, public finance, and inequality. But recently, she's also been focusing on labor markets and, in particular, on the impact of AI. Um, and she will be our main presenter tonight. After Marina's presentation, we are incredibly delighted that Chris, Sir Christopher Pissarigius, will be commenting on the presentation. Chris is the Regius Professor of Economics at the Department of Economics at the LSE. And as many of you will know, he was awarded a Nobel Prize in Economics for his work on frictions in the labor market. So a topic that is very much close to this issue and the disruptions, the potential disruptions of AI um, that we expect from AI in our labor markets. And I should say that those frictions are probably unprecedented um, compared to what we have gone through before. Chris is also the co-founder of the Institute for the Future of Work, um, which is an independent NGO that looks at the impact of AI and which is currently running the Pissarides Review on the impact of AI on employment. Um, and I should pass on his apologies in advance to the room because he has to go meet the governor of the Central Bank of Greece after this. <laughs> so he will have to leave the room after his um, comments and won't be here for the discussion. Um, and then following Chris's comments, we are also extremely pleased to have David Luara Martinez online, um, who will also discuss uh, Marina's presentation and paper. And he is providing us with a perspective from the public and the private sector. So on the one hand, uh, the, David is a um, partner of the Boston Consulting Group based in New York, where he is in the public sector practice. So that means he works with um, public institutions in the United States uh, on the use of AI or potential use of AI, which you can comment more about. And he is based at the Henderson Institute of the Boston Consulting Group, which is the research arm of, the, of BCG. So he'll be joining us online. And as for the rest, same procedure as always. So those of you in the room will be able to ask questions. Those of you online will also be able to send us questions through the chat and um, we'll have a discussion afterwards. For those of you who are online, I do, would just like to ask you to mute yourself so that um, we don't hear you in the room. And without further ado, I'm gonna pass over to Marina. Thank you so much for coming. Right, thank you very much. So thank you very much for having me. It's an honor to present here. And today I'm going to be talking about a new report called uh, the AI Artificial Intelligence in the Future of Law. So I think we are all convinced that artificial intelligence is going to have a, a big impact on the global economy but also particularly in the way that we work. I'm sure that many of you in the room already use a chat GPT or any type of toolbox to help in your assignment. And us as research as well are taking advantage of this tool to help in codings and uh, uh, developing algorithms and developing ideas. So when we started this research agenda, uh, we already think about artificial intelligence but what we noticed is that many of the reports and academic work that coming out was really focused on the impact of AI in advanced economies in the US and UK. And there was a little bit of a gap to try to understand what would be the impact in countries with lower level of development, like emerging markets and low income countries. And for us at the IMF is also key to be able to uh, uh, support our country members, but also to forecast what be, could be the impact of AI on a global labor force in a global labor market. Also, another gap is that we notice is that most of the work on AI was really focused on the exposure of AI. 
So how many tasks uh, workers are performing that maybe artificial intelligence algorithms and tools could perform? And these workers were speaking less about how AI could support the workers, so increase the complementarity, or which workers was going to be in risk. And that's a little bit another area that our report to try to have the first step to speak about. So I would say that we have six main questions that we're going to try to at least give some ideas. One is really to try to understand the differences in the impact of AI across countries. Then within countries is to really try to understand what is the impact uh, uh, across demographic groups. So which workers are more likely to benefit from these technologies and which workers are more at risk. Third, we're going to take a little bit of a historical perspective and look at the mobility of workers across the occupations that are more likely to benefit and the occupations that are likely to risk. And this is to help uh, to inform us about uh, the degree of adaptability that these workers can have when AI comes at full speed. The last part, we're going to use a model-based approach to try to understand what is the potential impact for AI to income inequality, but also to wealth inequality by taking into consideration the potential impact on the capital income channel. And this also is going to help us a little bit to talk about what is the potential impact to total factor to productivity. And lastly, we're going to look across countries and try to see how countries are preparing for this uh, transformation which countries are better prepared, which countries are less prepared, and what the countries are lacking in their uh, preparation. So let me just give the main findings. First, we find that 40% of global employment is exposed to artificial intelligence. And this is a large number. So many workers are going to experience uh, some kind of changes on their jobs because of uh, AI. When we look across countries with different levels of development, we observe that advanced economies have a much larger share of workers exposed to AI, close to 60%. And in emerging markets, the share is lower, 40%. And in poor countries, low-income countries, is only 26%. Now, looking across countries, we see that mostly half of these 40%, 6% are in occupations that are more likely to benefit, where they could experience an increase in productivity, while the other half and occupations that are more at risk. So we're going to see that there is this dual side of AI that can help some workers and can hurt some workers as well. And, uh, and across countries, we think countries we see that AI may actually increase uh, income inequality, but if the gains in productivity are so large, it may also increase the income of all workers in the economy in a calibrated model. And the last, across countries, I think is expected, that advanced economies are already much better prepared to absorb uh, artificial intelligence and the low-income countries, particularly, are really lagging behind. These poor economies still need to invest in a lot of basic infrastructure and training, while advanced economies should be thinking more about innovation, integration, and use it and regulation as well for AI. So let me jump a little bit more on the framework. So there is a, I'd say, growing literature that studied the impact of AI on occupations. So what it is the literature does, usually they use ONET. ONET is a dictionary of occupation. It's a, it's a, a, it's, it's a survey done in the US where they look at more than 1,000 occupations and they, and they ask workers mm -hmm. on each occupation what are the tasks that they do. So what research have been done is that they look at the, the tasks that the worker perform and they see how much of these tasks is overlapped to the capacity of general artificial intelligence. So in general, our work is highly exposed to AI if it performs many tasks that AI can do right now. 
So what we do, what we the, what we did is to use a similar approach to start to thinking about complementarity. We would say that our approach is a little bit more holistic because we want to take into consideration as well about the society acceptance of the use of artificial intelligence in performing jobs. So we explored two parts of your net that has been less used that we call work context. And one is this cube. And the work at the context take into consideration other aspects of the job besides tasks. For example, we look at six work contexts. One is the communication. Does your job need a lot of face-to-face -to -face interaction? Does you speak in public? Also, another important aspect is this responsibility of the job. What is responsibility of the work that you do? Does it impact the, the health of other workers, the well-being of other workers? A third part is where is your work performance perform? Is it perform inside or is it perform outside? And also the criticality of the errors. If you make a mistake in your job, what is going to be the consequences? Is it going to be critical for the performance of the job or the consequences are lower. And the third part, you look at the routinization, if there is rep repetition in your job, and the skills. So what are the level of education that is in the level of uh, training mm -hmm. that is needed to perform these jobs? So what is interesting, is, for example, is that a judge has high exposure to AI because AI technologies are very good in summarizing information. However, we, it's less likely that we are going to uh, let uh, such an important decisions be done by an artificial intelligence tool without any human oversight. So in this case, a judge is a good example of occupation that is highly exposed to AI because AI can perform many of the tasks that a judge does but it's shielded by AI because society is less likely to accept that these decisions are going to be done by artificial intelligence tools. On the same uh, similar, a clinical worker is also a worker that if her job, she performed or he performed many tasks that artificial intelligence can perform. However, it's a job that the criticality of decisions or if there is an error on the job, it has less consequences. So it's a job that is having more uh, higher displacement risk. <laughs> so here in this chart, we plotted all the occupations. And here is the uh, exposure index. So a high index means that the occupation is higher exposed. And a higher degree of complementarity means that the occupation is more shielded or has less risks. And we can see that in this case, we have a judge that has high exposed, but because of the criticality of the job, is going to more likely to see an increase in productivity. So there is low risk of AI. While a tele and telemarketing has higher exposed to AI, but lower complementary, so these jobs are more likely to be at risk. So what I'm going to be doing now is that on the lenses of uh, these four type of occupations, we think it exposes the first order. I'm going to look at occupations and employments across countries. So this, that, so to start, we are going to look at uh, occupations that we call high exposed and high complementarity, which occupations that are more likely to benefit, high exposed and low complementarity, occupations at risk, and occupations that are not ex low exposed. So occupations that where the task is the performance, AI is, is not, is less likely to at least right now to perform this task. So here's our first set of results. When we focus on the uh, two orange colors, we see that in the world, 40% of workers are exposed to AI. And when we break down, we see that less than 20% are more likely to benefit, and a larger share is at risk. And when we go look at across count, across a, a major group of countries with different development levels, we observe that in advanced economies, there is much higher levels of exposure However, there is also more potential for complementarity 
and as countries become less developed, they expose the decline, but also the complementarity decline. So in this sense, advanced economies are uh, more at, at, uh, at risk of short-term impact of AI, because there are a lot of workers here that are gonna have their jobs uh, touched by AI. However, they are also more likely to benefit from the gains of productivity of AI. So that's why we are concerned that, that it, at, at least at this stage, artificial intelligence may create increase of divergence across countries with different development levels because the benefits of AI are gonna be, uh, uh, that advanced economies are better positioned to collect uh, this, the benefits of the increases of productivity driven by artificial intelligence. Now, why did there be such a difference in exposed across countries? So here I'm looking at nine major occupations categories and I'm looking at the country that has higher exposure to AI for our micro data analysis. So here I'm gonna jump a little bit more on the micro data analysis where we use a household survey with a very granular occupation level. And what we find is that the, the main difference between an advanced economy UK, which has higher levels of exposure to AI in India is that the UK has higher level of exposure because there is a much larger share of workers in occupations that are professionals and managers, workers, and these workers are the workers that are more likely to benefit from AI. While in India, as an employment share, there is much lower share of workers in professional and manager, managerial occupations. Instead, they have a larger share of workers still in elementary occupations or rural sectors, and these workers are actually not exposed by AI. So the difference in the exposure across countries really comes from as well the difference in the structure of the economy of these two of the, uh, the development countries of these two countries. Now, what is interesting is that when we look within countries, despite these large differences in economic development, and we look for the characteristics of workers, it's actually very similar. In advanced economies and in most emerging market economy, actually women are more exposed to artificial intelligence and also more likely to benefit from AI. They are more exposed because they are more, more they have a higher share of jobs in professional jobs and also and and also in clerical jobs. So professional jobs are more likely to benefit from AI while clerical jobs are at risk. So women are gonna be more affected from this AI revolution, probably the men. The main exception is India because India is still female labor force participation is lower and there is still a lot of women in agricultural sector. Now, I think if you follow AI, this result is like what, the, what you're reading all had red lines. And uh, what you find is that the uh, AI exposure is higher for workers with a higher level of education. So that's why you hear that the AI is so different than automation because automation uses in fact workers with lower level education, middle skill, while AI exposure is much higher for workers with a higher levels of education, but also there is a higher share of these workers that are more likely to benefit. So these workers are more at the frontier of the impact of AI. And this is true across all countries in our sample. And what is interesting as well is that when we look uh, uh, on the distribution of these jobs across income distribution, what we find is that here focus only at the jobs that are at higher risk of AI is that the distribution of these jobs across the income distribution is quite flat with exception of India that is still a little bit increased, which means that the risks of AI are more equally distributed across the income distribution while the benefits of AI a higher concentrate at the top of the income distribution. So within country, our report indicated that the AI 
may increase inequality, and across country also increase inequality since advanced economies are better poised to benefit from it. So now I'm gonna move and focus on two countries that are the UK and the Brazil. And what I will look at, I'm gonna look, I'm gonna be using uh, household panel data to track uh, workers across their career and across their life cycle and to look at how often the workers move across occupations that are more at risk and occupations that are more likely to benefit from AI. And the idea of this exercise is to look a little bit on the adaptability of workers and their capacity to move across occupations. I just want to be clear that we are not measuring the impact of AI because this is historical data, but it's just to give a little bit of an idea whether these transitions are going to be costly or beneficial. So let's first focus on the transition of workers that were in occupations that are high exposed and low complementarity, the occupations that are more at risk of AI. And first we know that the, most of the time the workers, they when they move across occupations, they move across occupations within their occupation group. So within high exposed, high complementarity and within high exposed, low complementarity. However, we can see that here in Brazil and to a less extent in the UK, already historically workers in Brazil were moving from occupations that are at the risk to occupations that are more likely to benefit. So these transitions are, I would say, quite common, which can give you an idea that maybe workers are gonna be more likely or easily to adapt to this transformation. For example, when they looked at similar picture for workers in uh, what we call uh, pollution intensive sectors or brown sectors, we see that it's very, very likely that a worker that was working in a sector that is very polluting is gonna move to a job that is less polluting or green. So just to give you an idea that, uh, that uh, these transitions are, are frequent. Now, on the other hand, when we look across the life cycle of a worker, let's focus here on a college educated worker. And here is the occupation share of the worker over across his age group. We can see that college educated workers, they usually start in occupations that are more at risk of AI. And then they start to move with age as they get older to occupations that are more likely to benefit from AI. So, it, so if AI really affects negatively the occupations that are important for workers in the beginning of the life cycle, this can be problematic, but this seems to be an important stepstone on the career of workers. So there is this negative effect. However, there is also research showing that AI is very good on helping workers that have less experience, less tenure when they enter in the company, are the workers that see a large, a higher increase in the productivity. So there is this as well, the fact that AI may be a tool that is gonna help uh, younger workers to get uh, more experience and get up uh, to speed. So I just wanna highlight there's these two possible effects, one life cycle effect and one effect that come from uh, experiments. So we look as well on the earnings, what happened to workers when they move from uh, occupations at risk to occupations that are more likely to benefit. And in particular in Brazil, we see that this transition is followed by a wage premium. So the wage of these workers increased. So just to, like, so what we do in the, set, in the third part of the paper is that we build a general equilibrium model, actually based on model, a model from Benjamin Mohl, that is a professor here, that he had this model to talk about the impact of automation on inequality. And we adapted the model to be able to talk about the impact of AI. So the model, in the model AI has four main changes. So it's displaced workers. And in general, in the automation literature, when uh, labor displays capital, 
capital is more productive in producing the same task. So there is an increase in productivity by this channel. We also consider the effect of complementarity, which means that the economy is gonna shift for, by, by, for the, the value add of the economy is gonna shift it for sectors that have a more complementarity to AI. And usually these sectors are already the sectors that are high productive. So this also increased productivity. And we also gonna consider a TFP shock that is gonna increase the productivity of the entire economy. So this model is gonna be calibrated to the UK where we're gonna use the wealth and the asset survey to be able to replicate with the share of income that workers receive from transfers, labor income and capital income. And the fact that the high income households depend and have a much larger share of the income coming from capital income. And we are gonna feed the model the exposure to AI that we observe in the data across the income distribution and the degree of complementarity. And we are gonna run three experiments. One where AI is not fully uh, implementing that potential. One AI is fully implemented to its potential, but there is no extra gains in productivity. And when AI is fully implemented, but it's, and then there is an extra boost in TFP. And what we can see in that in both three experiments is that first is that we observe an increase in income inequality. And it, that's driven because of an increase in the labor income inequality, but particularly because there is a large increase from capital impact, right? As AI is implemented, firms, in, the profit of the firms increase, increasing the return of capital and capital income increases. Here, it looked like that there is a decline on the labor income at the top, but here is more like a reshuffle effect. So as capital income have become more important, some workers move it from the middle of the income distribution to the top of the income distribution. And what we find is that if the gains of TFP are large enough, there is, everybody's better off, but this is the best scenario. And so uh, I'm gonna jump this. First. So in the last part that we look is that we look at how countries are prepared to artificial intelligence. So we create a preparing an index and we look at four components. One is the digital infrastructure. The second one is the innovation and economic integration of the country. Third one is human capital, how many workers have a STEM degree, and the labor market policies, right? If labor market's flexible, and also the workers have assistance. And the last one is regulation and ethics. And we can see here, that one would expect, that the more advanced economies, rich economies are better prepared for artificial intelligence, while low-income countries are less prepared. And when we look across countries, we say that, uh, for example, that for low-income countries, what is particularly important is really to invest in the foundations of AI preparedness, is that you need to have access to internet, right? And it needs to be affordable for everybody. And you also need to have workers that have a better skill, workers working on stamps. Now, for countries that are more rich and more advanced, is really more about the legal framework, what we were talking before, and also investing in innovation, R&D, and make sure to be in the frontier. So just to conclude, concluded, we saw that uh, AI may generate labor market shifts with a significance cross, across countries. AI, it offers a potential for increase of productivity and growth. But there is a lot of risks of job displacement and also a lot of risk of an increase in equality with countries that can really uh, hurt workers and also hurt social cohesion. Now, in general, across countries, advanced economies are better prepared for that. And, emer and emerging markets really need to, and need to invest still in digital infrastructure and human capital. 
why advanced economies really need to invest more in R&D and regulatory framework. So for policies, Marie, for policy makers here, what is very key is that uh, we should really promote an equitable and ethical integration of AI, actually train the next generation of workers, and really protect the workers and try to reallocate and retrain workers that are really at risk of disruption. Now, one thing that is important about artificial intelligence is that there is this cross-border flow of information and, uh, and, and it's the nature of, of digital technologies. So we call us all for uh, uh, international cooperation across countries. So thank you. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much for that. I'm very glad to present such a nice, um, clear, uh, present your paper in such a nice, clear way. Provides a nice, uh, counting balance. You know, another presentation that you don't follow. But don't get me wrong, I, 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 I like a lot of what's in the paper, but it's usually when you spend the last um, few years thinking about these problems, you always think, oh, why didn't they do this uh, other thing and this other thing and, and all that. So let me go through some of the things that, um, that, that I liked and some of the things that I think you could be doing yeah, more to shed more light on what we really like to know uh, about AI. Now, now, first of all, one, one very nice thing about your presentation is that uh, you know, the way you're thinking about this is that it directly emphasizes uh, that humans have a choice of how to use AI. And uh, it would be nice to know how they make those choice, choices, which you obviously didn't get to, but at least you pointed out that um, you know, what the factors are influencing uh, decisions about the, the AI. It's good that you consider social and emotional constraints on uh, job distraction rather than uh, just the you know, sort of employment protection legislation, for example, that doesn't feature here. Um, now, AI, what, what I was telling, I said that AI will not necessarily lead to job distraction, even if you can take over many of the tasks of humans, which I think is a mistake that uh, so many economists have made, beginning with Frey and Osborne, where they claim 47% jobs would be lost in 10 years, and obviously they have lost even half of those, even a quarter of those. And that's because people just don't want to have so much uh, turnover. We never force when we're not ready for it. So the question is, what makes us ready for this uh, turnover, and, and uh, how can we make sure that we get it in as good a way as possible? It's, it's an example of um, the choice we have with AI, and it, it's, it would be quite good to see more discussion of this kind of, these kind of choices of what determines, what determines, determines them. Um, now, for example, if you don't, if, you, if there are behavioral reasons, like you mentioned some here, that you don't want to destroy the jobs, then then what, what happens to them? You know, do they not? Do you not take on AI? Do you take it on, but uh, you don't use it to destroy jobs? And I think that's probably where the, the weakest points of the of your paper come. I, I mentioned some more related to this later. Um, the um, you you seem to favor the case of uh, high exposure and high complementarity is the best combination. Because the incumbents introduce the AI anyway, but they stay employed. It, you, you didn't explain though how that comes about. You know, like if I if suddenly you discover an AI machine that uh, can do teaching as good as we do, but uh, of course with so such a moral professional, no one would dare fire us. We have tenure anyway forever. <laughs> like how how do we do it? You know, do we stand and watch the machine and make the presentation? That that's that's important. It's also related to the point I'm going to mention in a minute. That um, that that I find uh, your uh, two-dimensional description. Sorry, no. Uh, 
Yeah, no. Yes, it's, yes. I find you a two dimensional description of complementarity um, and the uh, exposure that, that you give is um, not, not a very good way of uh, describing things. And um, I, I'll say why just, just now. Now, my, my preferred two dimensional description is one in which AI is complementary to Sam Jones, but is substitutable to others, which is the more conventional way of thinking about it. In fact, in fact, I don't, I don't know if you were aware, but we use the word complementarity to mean two different things when you switch to the model um, and uh, Rachel, the paper that was done here. Rachel is descending from a man, but it was not a woman in case you didn't know. <laughs> it was our staff student when you wrote the paper. Um, and um, the, 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 the things you were saying, although you define them as being of the, of the subsidiary character, you said AI can do uh, things that uh, workers do, but for a variety of reasons, society, society would not allow those jobs to be destroyed. That's what I call subsidiability between AI and, um, and, and the workers. And um, your, your example in that actually, I thought, was, I thought was a bit unfortunate. You use lawyers as well as we have complementarity, but because society trusts humans to give an opinion more than, more than machines, lawyers will remain employed. They trust lawyers, are you serious? I mean, that's, there isn't, I, I'm lawyers in the state agents competing as to be which profession is the least untrustworthy. <laughs> but I think now we've been, we've been joined by conservative politicians here, so we have three three horse races as to who is the least uh, trusting. <laughs> Trust use doctors at least. Like <laughs> um, but but those those will not benefit from AI. That's the whole point. You don't take AI on because it's going to take your job. And therefore, you are, if society doesn't want you to, doesn't want the job to be done by a machine, then they're not going to take on the machine. So the fact that they have this, this exposure and, and this complementarity, the way you define it, is neither here nor there. They're not going to get productivity increases. I mean, the teaching example is better. If, if, if society thinks that students can benefit more from direct contact with the teacher. And, um, and, and then machines come along that discovered in Silicon Valley somewhere where they can do the teaching. And in fact, there are, you know, ChatGPT already is, is doing it. Then you will call that high complementarity, high exposure. And therefore you are saying, those are going to get productivity increases, the teachers are going to become super rich. As if you know, and, and so, but but in fact, that's not the case. We're not going to take on the machines because we want to maintain personal contact. The, the ones that will benefit are the ones where the machine is enabled to do extra tasks fast, but they don't take away your core uh, capabilities. If you go back to teaching again, the where, where there is complementarity and productivity will increase is if we can use AI, say, to uh, do a survey of the literature. But it will not take over the main activity. We use the survey of the literature as a way to uh, perform our jobs. You know, like when, I mean, take graduate students. When I was graduate student, you know, that building there was the library. Let's see. I spent the whole year sitting there, <laughs> reading and reading forever. I still have the, the, the notes in fact from that time. If I had Chat GPT, I wouldn't be doing that. In fact, yesterday I moaned to um, a colleague of mine, who will remain nameless, that uh, why, did, why did you write such a long paper? It is taking me so long to read it. Well, I won't, I, I won't curse the extra as well, because the insanity just mine. But this colleague came up with a very good suggestion. He said, why don't, you, why don't you scan the paper and put it into Chat GPT and ask it to summarize it for you? The critical points and, and, and any critique that he has, and then it's going to do it, and then there's nothing else for you to do. I didn't do that again until this is my 
that's what I mean. So, I, so you really need to distinguish between jobs that, that are truly complementary to the machine, the way um, the model and the um, and that is defining the way we define it everywhere. In real time, we'll give you a good chance to read the things that we write actually and we can see this well because that's how we define it under entirety. And um, once that are substitutable, and if you want to uh, emphasize that not all jobs that can be done by machines will be taken over by machines, which I think is an excellent point, and you need to make it and explain why, then go deeper in, into those jobs and use examples. You know, take uh, Fred Osmo, for example, or <clears throat> any one of those who follow, you know, like the, the MGI. I know that's a good competitor, but <laughs> I know their work <laughs> because I work for them sometimes. Um, and, uh, and, and say, why, you know, why aren't those jobs, why haven't those jobs been taken over? Um, I tried to read the, uh, the earlier paper as well, actually, and it was more despite my wrong papers, and I realized that uh, you follow the example of, um, I realized that it's very, very close to what you presented with the, uh, the reordering of authors. The, uh, ah, yeah. The, the way you have the, but, uh, but don't worry, you know, in fact, I was very happy to read it because one of those pieces of advice that uh, when I started as uh, an assistant professor here, one of these pieces of advice that one of the senior professors gave me is that you should write your own paper three times. Every one of your papers, which I took so seriously when it came with my work with Motors, so we wrote that paper 10 times, actually, more than three. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's a good idea to develop the idea and use it differently. So uh, don't feel bad about that. Um, but, but I really think you should, you should split that into two. You are, you are complementary with the it's, it's not credible the way you are saying it, just uh, something doesn't sound good when you say there is a lot of exposure, but it's, it's protected, and therefore productivity will go up. Productivity will go down, you, know, you get the opposite effect. You can, you can test it actually if you want. I, mean, I haven't tested it this one, but um, everyone will see. Anyway, you are now when you apply to countries, I think it is a little bit too static your uh, application. Um, the um, I mean to see to see that is to study. Suppose you were doing this analysis ten years ago, you would have concluded that China has problems because ten years ago China was uh, even more of an EM than it is now. Um, but then you have. A, a, you have an empty space, as it were. You know, you don't have all those vested interests from uh, big conglomerates and, and all that. In fact, for uh, for other reasons, I've been to years, I've been reading about South Korea because I'm going there next week. To so I thought I should take the tell that something more, more about it. And and they and the, the authors of that were saying that uh, South Korea is suffering from the fact that they developed such big conglomerates in the 1980s uh, and, and 90s, then when the AI came, it was very difficult for them to reform those conglomerates like Hyundai, for example, to use, a, use AI and uh, electrify and all that. And they cannot uh, compete with China that started from nothing. Therefore, they built up their car industry around, around the five uh, dreams, if you know. Do you know what? You know what's by your dreams in Chinese? A few? No? Who knows? Who knows what's by your dreams? Not even in Chinese, but only the non Chinese. Now. It, it's an electric vehicle. Oh, okay. <laughs> by, the, by the Tesla, it's the biggest electric vehicle in the world. And, and the reason is that they started from nothing. And um, that's, that's presumably what you knew it was, right? <laughs> I did ask you. <laughs> Um, so, so don't don't be critical of um, EM that inequality will increase. In fact, in the case of China, inequality between China and South Korea has decreased because China started from a kind of virgin field, if you like. Whereas the Koreans had those uh, Hyundai's and Samsungs and all that 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 were so 
they had so much fixed capital, so much sunk cost that they just couldn't give it up and so much political influence that they didn't even control the, the, the development. So you need to take on a more dynamic analysis there. Um, the emphasis on transitions when it came to uh, Britain and Brazil is quite good, um, but uh, that's another <laughs> normal subject in our work that we're doing that the is the future of work. Um, what, what kind of transitions are you talking about? Are they transitions between sectors of the economy? Are they between companies? Are they transitions within the company? Because I think the biggest uh, form of transition mm -hmm. that AI is bringing is what you might call role, role transition, which I was completely unaware that there is a psychological literature on role transition. It's not only economics, it's mm -hmm. non economic life as well, if it exists. <laughs> um, which is that uh, you take on your roles and you have to learn things. I mean, yeah, again, we know our profession better than any other, of course, otherwise we have problems. I mean, we've, we've had transitions to using even AI, but much more automation technologies here. You, you just learn it on the job. And when it comes to that, then what's the what the emphasis is, should be is, is what kind of skills do people get in? And we we found some quite surprising results actually in the, when we looked at the skills of the okay, I don't think, not the survey you were looking at, although we might be bringing that in the future work by looking at skills and surveys. Yes, skills. Um, let me collaborate with that. And, um, and, and it would be good if you did that. If you look at our website, you just find the data analysis. No, it doesn't. It's not there yet, actually, in the future. Um, then, um, okay, and finally, one of my, my, pet, <laughs> my pet subjects. Again, it's funny. I'm not sure that we have time. Um, but you know, te technological progress always brings transition transitions of work as structural changes in the economy. And um, AI seems to be frightening people. Whereas in the past, people were much more excited about technology. And in fact, even, even when AI started, people were very excited about it. If you think of the smartphone, how excited we were, people still are actually most of us. <laughs> um, that you know, when, when electricity came out, for example, people were really excited because they have all those electrical appliances at home. But those destroyed more jobs than AI will ever destroy, I guarantee you. Because all the domestic services, all the people in the assembly lines in factories, you know, like before electricity, or when it first came up, manufacturing was growing 40% of the labor force. Now it's growing 10 to 15 in a year. And soon it would be in China too, which is still employing about 25%. And yet we're so excited about it because it gave us more time for leisure. It gave us all these appliances to work with instead of doing hard labor. So why, why is AI scaring people? You know, what's different about AI and scaring people? In my view, what's different is that um, the less important, I think, is that it affects more highly qualified people mm. and uh, they are much more concerned about their jobs, or at least they're much more vocal about losing their jobs. But, but the other one is information, that we have much less information about it. So it's, it's the unknown, and then we don't know what's coming. And people are always scared of the unknown. And um, and it would be good to um, have some discussion on that. Uh, now, for that, again, you need um, a, a dynamic study. You need to uh, see what workers are thinking, what employers are thinking about those things, what is being done. But um, that's all exciting stuff. So well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, 
Yes, can you? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Um, Kristen, thank you for the very generous invitation. Marina, thank you for the presentation and to you and your colleagues for this very, very interesting paper. And of course, to you, Sir Christopher, as well, for, for these very interesting comments. Um, I think a variety of which I, I share in spirit. So let me just break up what I think are the three most salient points of what the, what the paper contributes to this fascinating discussion on the labor impacts of and macroeconomic effects of AI generally. One, this idea of transcending the task-based framework, I think, is, is uh, extremely welcome, um, even if the exact details of the complementarity account or substitutability perhaps can be expanded upon. But the thought that looking at the task composition of jobs is insufficient is an important and I think an underappreciated one. Um, in fact, just to build on what Sir Christopher mentioned a moment ago, um, we often, the way we talk about uh, this with clients is in the context of automation versus augmentation as possible deployments of the technology with respect to human workers. And the question of the social license to use AI is orthogonal to that. For a variety of reasons, regulatory, policy, ethical, and otherwise, you may or may not want to be AI to be part of the equation, regardless of whether AI is capable of fully automated a job, uh, automating a job, or merely augmenting a job. Um, so there's there's greater complexity, I think, to explore there, and I'll, I'll volunteer a couple of thoughts based on our research at BHI in a moment that I think bear on that. But the point is the the tax uh, task based exposure account is indeed um, quite narrow and um, this paper's push in a more expansive direction is, is very welcome. Two, it's also very valuable that you're looking at the differential impact across different labor markets. Lots of the work out there uh, focuses on individual national economies, looking at those interaction effects is, is very important. It's something that we also um, spend a lot of time thinking about uh, when working with large corporations that have a global footprint and that face uh, international competitive pressures. I, I, I'll, I'll have a couple of thoughts to share on that as well. And the same goes for the AI preparedness index. Um, I, I think it's especially important to remind policymakers in emerging market and low income economies that regulatory action may be the long ha the low hanging fruit, but it will be far from decisive, and it is very unlikely to be a determinant of AI value capture uh, for for those countries. I think that's that's very very important. So I'll, I thought I would offer some some of the insights that at a place like BCG through our research, but also through our client engagements, uh, we're able to glean into three um, important aspects of this discussion. One is the rate of adoption. Um, to Sir Christopher's point just a moment ago, when one um, abstracts from sort of the, the static picture, the, the current state versus the end state, and really looks at what might be the likely dynamics of how this plays out over time, um, I think the picture that emerges is 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 quite interesting and perhaps um, less likely to fall prey to those to those fears that one understands, but maybe maybe overhyped in the context of AI disruption. And I think this is especially important to get a sense around the human toil of labor disruption. It is one thing to say that the labor composition of the economy, its occupational profile, is going to change dramatically. It is altogether different to say that that process itself might take long enough to enable worker adaptability and to really sort of ameliorate the individual human worker impact of the long-term disruption, which we, of course, I think all agree is quite significant. The second point I, I, I want to raise is around factors not considered in the model um, for perfectly understandable reasons, but are very interested in shaping the likely outcome uh, from an international perspective, the the likely divergence or the deepening of the divergence and the gap between advanced economies and others, um, not knowing what we do not know about the future, you know, to the, to the example about China. And finally, a few thoughts on complementarity and how AI is actually deployed in real business contexts and, and the very factors, the very many factors to which that is sensitive beyond the question of social license and, and societal permission to utilize AI or appetite for the utilization of AI. So first on the point of adoption, I think it's very important to remember or to ground ourselves in the fact that 
pre-generative AI adoption rates were quite low. It was rather slow, especially considering for how long AI has been out there, how powerful it is, independently of the current hype around generative models. It was really a um, telling survey in the US of north of half a million businesses of all sizes in 2019. I believe it was the National Science Foundation. And what they found was stunning. Only 25% of large US businesses, that is companies with 5,000 or more employees, only 25% as of 2019 were using AI for creation of products or services. Only 25%. And again, it's a technology that we've known to be revolutionary for a long time. We're talking about algorithms that have been out there for a while. And in a highly advanced economy among large corporations, the adoption rate just a few years back was only 25%. Now, build on top of that the fact that it is very likely to expect that companies that have adopted traditional AI algorithms are also more likely to now adopt generative AI algorithms that suggest that the sort of the universe for likely near-term uptake in the business world with Gen AI is actually smaller than it might have been with analytical or discriminative or, or predictive algorithms, whatever you prefer designation might be. Um, and that 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 clears with perceptions uh, among business leaders. We, we at BCG earlier this year, year run a survey of about 1,400 C-suite executives globally. And we asked them, what is your current take on Gen AI in particular? And what we found is that 90% of them, 90% I, I, are either in a wait and see or minimal experimentation mode. That's very, very far from the thought that everyone's rushing to deploy ChatGPT or whatever other Gen AI models out there at scale. It's a very, very far cry. None of this is to deny that Gen AI in particular and AI more broadly are profoundly transformative, but it does suggest that the rate of adoption, that most critical of assumptions in how the transition actually plays out in the labor market, might be very slow compared to some of what um, one might be led to expect given the current hype around this topic. And the last point on adoption is that for purposes of modeling especially, and when one thinks about the levels of exposure to AI augmentation or automation, there's always a temptation to think in terms of the state-of-the-art technology. What can state-of-the-art systems do? What in what way are jobs therefore exposed, given state-of-the-art capabilities? But the reality is that adoption does not track, at scale at any rate, does not track the state-of-the-art. The technology changes too fast, and it is very unlikely that companies, even those that embark upon this complex journey of, a, of AI adoption, will always be at the forefront of the technological capability. So there's even a distinction to be drawn between the theoretical exposure of jobs as a function of what the technology is capable of doing at any given point in time, that being a function of state-of-the-art model capabilities, and the actual exposure associated with the models that are in fact deployed and used by businesses in the real world. And what I'm suggesting is that there's very good reason to expect that there's going to be a gap. And in fact, um, if one is to take seriously the observed pace of progress in the world of Gen AI over the last several months, couple of years now, then that gap is going to widen over time. I mean, consider for a moment the fact that as of January 2024, 90% of executives in large corporations worldwide were, worldwide were saying, we're waiting or we're experimenting a tiny bit. But since the time GP, ChatGPT was released to the public and the time we conducted that survey, the world suddenly already had multimodal models. We went from LLMs to LMMs in that period of time while executives were still trying um, to kind of wrap their minds around the technology. So that on the on the question of adoption, and, and again, I think that suggests that the margin for individual worker level adaptation over the course of this whole transition might be more generous than 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 one uh, could perhaps expect just by looking at the at the perceptions that are voiced and sometimes quite loudly in the context of, of, of the ongoing AI discussion. On the second point, the sort of international dynamics or the dynamics across national economies, I think there's reason to worry about two factors that could contribute to a widening gap 
um, that would be interesting to, to consider in the context of this analysis. One is data and talent gaps. Um, so independently of the composition of a national economy in terms of its industry makeup and occupational profiles, which in turn you know, drives the degree to which that economy could in principle benefit from the technology, there are significant disparities in terms of the data access and the talent access that are critical to being able to deploy the technology in the first place. Um, and second, I think it's very important to consider the various degrees of competitive pressure towards adoption um, in advanced economies as compared to emerging markets and low-income countries. If you set aside the case of businesses in low-income and emerging markets that have um, nearshoring or reshoring threat to some of their product and service offerings, there's a real question as to whether those uh, companies in those economies face nearly as much pressure, competitively speaking, to automate, especially when the local cost of labor is that much lower as it is in many cases compared to the situation of peer businesses in advanced economies. Adopting AI is expensive. It requires time, commitment, resources, a certain appetite for risk, depending on the case. And there has to be a good business case for that. And the business case will not be, more often than not, how marvelous or mind-blowing an application might be. DALI is a stellar model. It's incredible. You give a natural language prompt, it automatically generates fantastic images. It is hard to see how that transforms the cost equation for a business or its competitive advantage uh, for most corporations at any rate. And so hard pressed to find implementations of AI in many cases that will drive competitive advantage and in a situation where the local cost of labor is lower, comparatively speaking, versus advanced economies, there may be many businesses in low income and emerging markets that, in addition to perhaps lacking the access to data and talent, may just not face the requisite local competitive pressure to move fast enough around AI. So one situation that could be really interesting to model is what happens if the rates of adoption are different in advanced economies versus the rest? What happens when, the, when advanced economies move faster in terms of AI adoption? On the third point around complementarity. How does AI actually integrate with human workers? Uh, this is an area we've been conducting lots of research on. Last year, we, we did an experiment jointly with a group of scholars at HBS and Wharton at MIT to look at the ways in which knowledge workers actually use Gen AI and what happens when they do different sorts of things with these systems. And among the many findings, one that I, that I think is quite, quite interesting is we did find, not surprising to anyone, I'm sure, that using Gen AI systems boosts create performance on creative tasks at the individual level. But we also found that that comes at a cost at the collective level. Individuals did on average 40% better in terms of their creative output, but there was a 40% reduction in the diversity of ideas when you pull individuals together. There's a cost in terms of collective creativity, despite the boost in individual creative performance. When we found this, we said, okay, we have to go deeper. And we are in the process of working on a series of, of, of papers um, that will be coming out in the next couple of months to understand how you need to design workflows with Gen AI quite differently, depending on the organizational context, largely as a function of what are the innovation goals that you have. And to put matters very simply, businesses that require radical innovation might find the use of generative AI for ideation, which is considered one of the archetypal use cases, to be actually detrimental. And the point, the reason I bring this up is that in addition to the social license to deploy AI, in addition to the theoretical um, boundaries of what the technology can do, which drives kind of theoretical exposure, in addition, again, to the boundaries of the technology that's actually used, there are organization-specific features that significantly shape the extent to which jobs are actually exposed in terms of you know, likelihood of substitutability or complementarity or whatever else we want to we want to call it. And, and that's a very hard um question to pin down and generalize and draw significant inferences on uh, with the state of research. But what we do know for sure is that it is a non-trivial question. And a job type um, description, that level of description is not sufficient to capture the many, many shades of gray in the question around complementarity. 
and a final observation um so that we can move on to to people's questions i think it's it's critical in this regard um and again on the point of people's fears about ai to recognize that the limits of our imagination are not the limits of the economy uh, i'm very glad that christopher brought up the the example of electricity and indeed when one looks at other general purpose technologies what's readily apparent is that when they first emerged everyone was in awe nobody really knew what they were going to shape and how and to what extent um and it is in that context also very important i think to remember that jobs are institutions and like any other institution there's somehow within our collective control there are malleable entities um i always find it sobering to remember that when balzac wrote the physiology of the employee in the 1840s he still referred to the idea of people not working on Saturdays as the English week. That's a thing that the English do, but we, the French, don't yet. Um, and now we don't even have to make it explicit that when we talk about work, we more often than not mean a five-day week. And I'm not suggesting that that's the dimension of the institution of employment that will change. All I mean to suggest is that what we mean by a job is not um, an exogenous parameter. Um, it's not a fixed boundary and the contours of this uh, disruption, and especially the possibility of large scale productivity gains, might lead us collectively as a society to reshape the way we think about jobs. And that, again, um, will have a huge effect in the actual human toil associated, at least in people's imagination, with the indisputable disruption to labor markets that will be brought on by artificial intelligence. Thank you so much. Wonderful. So we're going to move on to the discussion. Just give, you a, give, you a, give you a chance to respond. Yes, yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Before I do that, <laughs> I wanted to, to this this is actually probably also to do with what um Marina will have to respond to is. For those of us who are working on labor markets with the data that is available from public sources, such as labor force data, household survey data, or even ad hoc surveys or um, surveys of companies, I think the key thing that comes out of a discussion like this, and which is particularly relevant, of course, for public policy, is how woefully inadequate our data infrastructure is so that we can begin to think about these issues. So, for example, Marina, the IMF, working with labor force survey data, there's no way you can capture the nuances of a discussion like this. I think governments are incredibly yeah. overprepared yeah. and very behind in thinking about this in terms of how their data tools should be changed and adapted, connected, linked, um, so that we can even begin to scratch the surface of this. A simple example of this is we don't we have estimates in the UK of how many workers are in the gig economy that range from almost zero to very large percentages. So um, that just is a sort of introductory discussion because I'm sure Marina has had to deal with this in her study. Before we go on to questions and comments, Marina, would you like to respond to a few things? Uh, again, I'll sure. share maybe so um, the microphone. Oh, there is. Sure. So first, thank you too for the Great comments. And uh, so let me first talk about the component that it seems to be the main comment. So, first is that uh, what the way that we see is that this is a scale of complementarity, right? So, some of their jobs are more. And we internally, we debate a lot about uh, how we would call it. So uh, let me say that not all my authors were really thrilled with talking about substitution and complementarity, right? So the, what is happening is, is there is a range of, uh, of each occupation is on this range of the index. And some have more, some of my authors prefer to say shielding and some of those have less shielding. And we decide to go through with complementarity, but someone, some want to do complementarity, some other want the substitution. It was not easy to 
to come up with a new term as well. So we, we want to do something that people can understand. So you distorted our already existing term, right? <laughs> <laughs> we distorted a little bit. Uh, shielding, shielding is better. You yeah, like shielding. I, I, I'm kind of be happy yeah. that you like shielding. Okay. okay, shielding. He was pushing more to, it's funny, Antonio Spimbler who was pushing for the shielding term. And let me, <laughs> So let me just say one thing. Now, one thing that it, I understand that the, the judge was an example that you, I guess, but I, I think our view is really that, the, and, and it, it's interesting that you come up with the doctor example. And from my point of view, the doctor, I see for them something that society in poor countries, in low-income countries, where they don't have access to any doctor, to any diagnostic in a village, it, they're much more likely to trust an uh, 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 artificial intelligence tool with respect to what they should do, what prescription, what medicine they should do, than someone in advanced economies. So even I feel that the society context regarding the use of artificial intelligence, which, it, which we discussed, which is the behavior part, like how do you accept the technology can be quite different depending on the country that you are in the context that we are. This one, of course, is, was based on the on that in the survey. So these values are values that are made in, really from the US. Now, I and I, let me say that this is our first work on this. And we we of course that we ask, we understand that this is uh, this is there is a lot of reallocation that can happen on the economy and transformations that we cannot really foresee. So the way that we see and after what is going to happen to low income countries, right? We see what we observe in our membership is many times countries with less level of development seem are much more excited about technology. For example, in Africa, that AI can help you with tutoring and they help like closing gaps that we observe in advanced economies. So the excitement is quite different. And I think that that is something interesting to speak about. Now, uh, regarding uh, uh, David's question as well about the using of uh, AI, for example, the competitive pressure about uh, in countries where the labor costs are very low, why should we adapt AI? My main concern is that uh, as well that for many countries, for example, certain service to trade jobs that were jobs that uh, the service trade economy that was a way of economies to develop now that was saw as a growth potential, that these jobs may be affected by artificial intelligence, right? You don't need to more have a telemarket operator. In India, you're gonna have a, just artificial intelligence. So on the development level, I also think that this is important, Martin. Thank you very much. That, that's also an important mark that we can take into consideration. But one thing that we don't, uh, discuss in the report, but something that we already think about the institution is what you touch, right? Is what is gonna happen to uh, competition across firms, right? We already live in a world that uh, the top firms are having a higher market share. Those are the firms as well, but the nature of AI, you need a lot of data. So if you're Amazon, you have a lot of data of the transactions of the workers. So not even talking about the cost of the technology, the nature of a big, big business is gonna take advantage of that. So there is not there is a lot of potential pay impact on live a lot about uh, competitive markets, product markets besides labor market. But on this work, we really focus more on the labor market part. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, so first of all, a round of questions from the room to either Marina or David. Um, anyone with questions, please raise your hand, state your name, introduce yourselves and speak up because we don't have a microphone for this role. Yeah, Chris Martin from BCG. Hey, David, thanks for, for joining. Um, what we have seen, in, if, if history is a measure, is 
is that there may be surprises for us in adoption of AI. For example, if I go back to the time where, you know, laptops and then mobile devices and so forth, and we saw certain emerging economy who simply jumped the laptop space. They moved from zero to mobile device. And that has happened before. So what is what leads us to believe that there may be economies in particular in emerging who do a similar leap and move to very low usage to going, you know, just passing by and adopting much quicker, despite competitive pressures or not, then actually at least it has happened before. It's not something we, we haven't seen. And, and I remember at the time I was working for a company in that business, a lot of, uh, you know, economies and, and companies were actually surprised by that leap, saying, you know, they, they left out the middle stage and, and moved. Um, I was just throwing that out as, as a discussion point. It would be interesting in your thoughts. Uh, so one, uh, maybe David can talk a little bit about more the private sector part of it. Uh, I feel that uh, that's, of course, that's a possible, that would be a good outcome. Yeah. But we feel that it, in still countries really to invest in their infrastructure, right? Because you cannot uh, leapfrog without the basic access to internet. And also if you don't have the skills to use these technologies, so 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 I see that like countries that could do that are more a little bit on the middle income uh, uh, EM like frontier, but uh, but that's an important aspect. Yeah, I, I I think that's right, and as I see it, this is a place where it's really important to distinguish Gen AI from from other types of technology within this broad AI family, at least for purposes of the discussion, for a couple of reasons. One is that unlike other algorithms, Gen AI um, systems have very high marginal cost of use, right? When you, when you think about the Google search engine, it costs a ton of money to build it. The marginal cost of a query is very low. It appro approaches zero. Not true in the case of large language models, large multimodal models. So it's even if you have access, there are significant cost barriers in the context of at least today's language models. And even if that industry evolves towards smaller specialized models with lower cost of inference, um, which is what we think will happen as it did with computers generally, right? With the modularization of computing after the mainframe, um, even if that's the case, the most Gen AI services will be provided by companies most likely in advanced economies because what you need for that is talent and data. And so whoever has the talent and the data is going to be able to create the supply for generative artificial intelligence services, even as the industry itself fragments, right, beyond the, beyond the big tech giants. So it's hard to see how, how non-advanced economies will become meaningful players as opposed to consumers of the technology and the AI adoption and the economics, um, not, not just in the labor market in the systems, but the broader economic effects of AI adoption are just a function of being able to access it as uh, for use. So that's one thought, but the two, the second thought, and this is kind of a, a countervailing factor is that Gen AI systems in particular are easier to use. Um, they have perhaps one of the lowest cognitive barriers to entry of any general purpose technology. All you need is natural language. Um, and that's that's very promising. Um, and you know, one would hope that if anything, it serves accelerate the possibility for autonomous upskilling for workers. Um, that can in turn aid in the tr labor transition in the face of, of disruption. So I mean, no, no point in attempting futurology as to the likelihood of leapfrogging in the context of Gen AI, time will tell. But I do think it is it is hard to see how that happens if we haven't seen that pattern play out already with non-generative algorithms, even as developing countries or emerging markets and low-income economies have moved very fast in digitization. Um, and for example, mobile access, which is, I take it, part of what you're, what you're commenting on. So... Not having seen that precedent is 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 hard for me to see how that would happen with generative AI models, which I think it is 
in large part the the focus of the of the analysis here, or at least what prompts it. Jacob. Um, yeah, hi, Jacob, based here at the LSE. Thank you for the paper and for the discussion. I was uh, wondering if you either or both could say a bit more about a point that I thought implicitly came out of your conclusions and then uh, David's Balzac uh, footnote, and that is um, the relationship of the analysis and the implications you draw from this uh, in the context of how we think about the future of work and the function of work in terms of um, supplying labor to earn our livelihoods or institutions around jobs, because I thought in your conclusions, it sounded like you take all of that as static and given and don't really think about policy implications from, from this work and other things on maybe rethinking or redoing uh, the institutional framework around that, thinking about earning livelihoods, not by making humans more competitive against AI, for example, but you know rethinking our social institutions um, and so, yeah, I was just wondering if you could comment a bit more on that. When you're thinking about the, like a base income, that's already. I mean, a question to you. I'm not, you know, <laughs> I was wondering what your thoughts were. Ah, yeah, yeah, sorry. Ah, yes. So, yeah, no, no, I, I have seen some pieces discussing about what is going to happen in the future, right, where and uh, humans really don't have job. Most of the work is done by AI and robots, right? And if we are a little bit more on a service uh, leisure economy. Uh, I have to, so in this thing, uh, regarding this, our, our, our PC really doesn't go into this uh, thought process. Uh, we see this as a work more that is speaking about the next five years, like a medium term horizon uh, work, because exactly everything that we said, there is so much uncertainty, so much potential for reallocation. Our, our firm's going to adopt this technology that uh, our thought never went so much outside the box. So in terms of labor market policy and institutions, what we see is that there is a role for governments, for example, to support the workers that are going to be negatively affected by reskilling and upskilling. And one thing also to have a, a good unemployment insurance system during this transition. But particular, what we are advocating should be proactive, right? That's a little bit the goal of this piece. It's really to show policymakers that there is a lot of potential for disruption. And if they should not wait so much to start thinking about that when workers uh, are already affected, right? So that's, uh, the, the, that's a little bit how we're it's a, a little bit because we are restricting ourselves for this short term horizon. We didn't go over such a long term goal of changes of course. Yeah, no, that that I think makes um makes sense. And I, I also I'm afraid don't don't have a very good answer in terms of what one ought to do. I think what's important to remember is that um a lot of fears about labor disruption brought on by AI do take the institutional contours of jobs as fixed parameters implicitly. And that's what's just not true. Um, we may not know exactly how employment will change, but employment is an institution. It is malleable. It is within our control and it will change in various ways as it has in the past. Uh, the invention of the weekend is just an example, but there are many ways in which it can evolve. The invention of unemployment insurance, all sorts of other institutions but and i and i think here it's it's sobering and important to recognize our unknown unknowns as it were um there's a there's a fascinating national bureau of economic research uh, paper of 2022 that looks at the occupational composition of the us labor market and what they find is that the majority of employment as of 2018 in the US happened in job specialties that were all introduced after 1940. So if we do have reason to expect AI to be as transformative as, as, as indeed I believe it can be, 
then there's also good reason to expect that the nature of work and the way we work will both um, change in ways that we may not be able to predict today, but it, it at least argues for greater flexibility in our institutions, in our regulation, better willingness to rethink what we have grown used to as um, kind of the standard contours of employment as a, as a human institution. And also important to remember that there is that uh, many advanced economies we have an aged population and the labor market is in the UK as well, that's to a lot of shortages, right? We have shortage of talent, unemployment rate is particularly low. And if and, and if the population keep going to the strain of aging, is that too we, we need we're gonna need few workers, right? So. I think that's right. Um I think that's exactly right. And, you know, for all we know, AI itself may be part of the solution. I think, Marina, this is a very important point you've made a couple of times. Um, if if Gen AI is indeed something like a knowledge general purpose technology, think about what that means in terms of how companies will eventually hire. Domain specific knowledge may cease to be as relevant as it is for many roles today, for many positions. And with access to knowledge, being so dramatically simplified and not just the theoretical access, but the conversational natural language interface way of accessing knowledge and digesting knowledge. There's good reason to think that in many, many contexts, businesses will tilt towards hiring as a function of raw, fungible cognitive power, cognitive ability, project management execution skills. Um, and so it's it's also important to, to consider how even the, the standard barriers to entry to some forms of occupational roles, which can often be associated with knowledge, which domain expertise may themselves change and be lowered as a function of this technology um, as well. So that may even ease transition between occupations, between industries, um, who knows, but it's it's part of what, what's unknown, but this is unknown, unknown, I suppose. Thank you. So we have I want to close with one question, Chair's privilege. Apologies. We have to be out of the room soon. But there was um, one issue that we did mention during the discussion that you mentioned as well, which is the requirement for a certain infrastructure that has to be there so that countries can adopt the AI technology and develop it further. So, of course, one of those is Internet and telecoms and so on. Um, but the other is also energy infrastructure, um, which is huge, yes. semiconductors and so on. Um, and my understanding is that, it, you know, one of the things that could potentially also slow down the process of AI adoption is a shortage of that infrastructure. So from a an institutional sort of development institution, IMF, World Bank, um, Interregional Development Bank's perspective, I wanted to ask you whether you have a sense of to what extent the institutions are taking this into account, preparing for this and funding that kind of investment. And maybe David, um, from the US perspective, especially since you work in the public sector, to what extent is this really on the horizon? I mean, and I know we have you know, new programs for creating um, semi um, uh, building semiconductors in the US, et cetera, but, but really is that with the potential of AI in mind already, or is this just like a minimum supply in case we get cut off from South Korea or something else disastrous happens? So um, this is my last question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, you, so at the fund, we don't uh, loan to yeah. projects. We loan yeah. to countries. Yes. Yeah. So to be clear, but electricity has always been like for years uh, in the series a big bottleneck for growth in Africa, right? Beyond the AI, this uh, because you know for health for so many aspects. And I know that the, the bank it has uh, financed a lot of uh, projects to increase electrification. And, but now the main twist is not AI, to do it in a sustainable way. Great. Okay. So I don't think that the AI aspect is there on the thinking. What is really on the thinking is more the climate. Sustainable thinking. Yeah, the sustainability. Business. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in my initial comments, I, I made the point that it is important not to assume that adoption out there in the real world is always adoption of state-of-the-art models and technologies. And a lot of what we're seeing around the supply-side constraints in the semiconductor space is precisely about state-of-the-art. 
to get very concrete, we're talking more often than not, H100 um, microchips produced by NVIDIA <laughs> and, and a handful of others. These, this type of hardware is only necessary for a very small fraction of the work of the world's compute workload. You really need it to train a foundation LLM. Arguably, you may need it for um, inference as well, but for that, there, there's other hardware that is that, that is available. But my point is, when, when, when we see all the talk about the supply side constraints and the access to compute power, specifically as a function of hardware, it's really about state-of-the-art hardware for state-of-the-art models, and it's about the frontier. It is therefore, of course, very geopolitically significant, but I don't think it bears on the large scale adoption of AI as a broad family of technologies globally. If you look at what's happened with compute power prior to generative um, artificial intelligence systems, it was exploding all over the place in terms of demand. Why? Because of digitization, because of big data, because of the deployment of traditional or analytical or predictive or discriminative algorithms, um, none of which has anything to do with this particular discussion that's happening right now. And that's very important for other reasons around leading hardware and constrained access to a specific type of compute power that's necessary for developing and training state-of-the-art foundation models. It's a very, very narrow sliver of the entire workload, um, compute workload demand globally. And I, I, I'm not convinced that we should expect it to be a blocker for adoption. Might it slow down the pace of continued scaling of foundation models? Yes, perhaps yes. Right, GPT-3 had something like 700 billion parameters. GPT-4 had 1.8 trillion parameters. Maybe access to H100 chips will make it harder to reach whatever the next milestone might be for OpenAI. Sure, but that I think has no direct bearing on the rate of adoption, which again ties to the point that the real world uptake of these technologies is much slower than we might think when we're just looking at the news and reading about the latest developments at the cutting edge of the technology itself. Great, thank you so much. Well, this was a fantastic discussion. I'm so grateful to all of you for, uh, for coming, to Marina especially, um, for coming here to London, to David in New York. And um, yeah, with that, thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we can have continued discussions on this topic going forward. Thank you. Thank you.